Yeah, hiya. Yeah. J just about to. Does it matter? Okay. Hello, can everyone hear me? Wave if you can hear me. Okay, you can all hear, so that's good. I've just temporarily muted everyone because we were getting a lot of people sort of chitter chatter and dogs and things in the background and whatever. So I just thought if I mute everyone, then uh, when Laura's ready to start, we, we won't have so much background noise going on. So don't worry about being on mute. Um, and I think we're going to put questions in the chat as well. Um, so I'll be monitoring that. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name's Donna Jones, I'm waving at you. Um, I think most of you um, have probably um, been emailing me backwards and forwards throughout the week. Um, so it's 11 o'clock now, so I think we'll get started. Um, I'd just like to say welcome to you all and thank you for joining us. Um, today's 
presentation, um, Laura is, um, she's our um, specialist palliative care social worker. She's going to be starting off the presentation. And then we have uh, two other um, uh, of our family support team, um, Andy and Rebecca, um, uh, joining the presentation as well for you. Um, we, we think the, uh, the presentation will probably last for about um, an hour and then we'll be able to open up to questions. You will see um, that we, as Carl mentioned uh, a moment ago, Carl's our administrator that works um, at St Richard's Hospice and he has popped everybody on mute um, just simply because um, we can tend to get a quite a lot of background noise and feedback and things. But if um, you have any questions, you will notice probably down the bottom of your screen if it's a laptop or often up in the top right hand corner there's a few little dots if you hover over that it will open up um, the chat facility and what that is is just sort of a messaging um, facility that enables you to write any questions you have any thoughts um, any feedback that you want to add um, as it's in your mind and then we can go through that afterwards and um, we'll have uh, probably about an hour or so for that sort of open discussion and conversations. We are expecting probably about 100 participants. So as you can imagine, that's a lot of people for a lot of chat. So if we don't get to any answer any of your questions, Laura is going to provide her email address. Um, and um, you can either um, sort of resend your question or we will endeavour to uh, capture uh, your name and um, and then sort of respond to you um, after the, the presentation if we can. Um, we are as well recording this presentation because we had so much interest in today's date, um, today's session, because I think obviously people are starting to go back to work as we know um, soon and um, I think a lot of people couldn't make the later dates. So we're recording this session so that we can upload it um, to uh, sort of via YouTube, but it will be on our, our website and I can send the, uh, the link out um, to people as well so that you can revisit it and, and look at it again. Um, so um, when we are having conversations, obviously we consider confidentiality and wouldn't mention particular names and things. We would just talk about sort of clients and, and things like that. So I think um, I've covered everything we need to go through. So I will hand you over to Laura to begin. Hi everyone. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Get a thumbs up if you can hear me. Perfect, great. So welcome to our training today. Um, and hopefully technology will work so we can get onto the next slides, which um, it isn't. <laughs> Let me see if I can get to the next slide. Just to say while Laura's playing playing with the system we we had some um, electricity and IT issues um, at the hospice today and um, we were all in and socially distanced and ready to get going and then we've all had to scarper back to our homes um, so that we can uh, we can deliver this today so uh, so it's been a last minute rush but I think it looks like uh, Laura's mastered it so I'll leave you to it. <laughs> Yeah, so off to a great start, but here we go, we've got it working. So welcome to our training, um, supporting children through COVID-19 grief and loss. Um, today myself, um, my name is Laura McLeod, I'm a palliative care social worker based at St Richard's Hospice and a few of my colleagues will be taking you through the training today. We hope this training um, will provide useful to yourselves as, as teachers and within staff within schools. Um, it is quite a generic overlook um, but we're hoping you can take the information today and adapt that to, to your specific needs. And obviously with the time at the end for questions, hopefully we can answer some that you may have. So who are we? So we're in St Richard's Hospice um, and we also have Bereavement Support South Wish to share within the hospice as well. So myself and the family support team, so we're made up of four palliative care social workers within the children and families team and also a children and families practitioner. So we provide pre and post bereavement support to children and families who are known to the hospice, but through our bereavement support South Worcestershire, we also provide bereavement support to those who aren't known to the hospice but do have a South Worcestershire GP. We also provide pre and post bereavement therapeutic groups for children and families 
to come along and meet some other people in a similar situation and share how they're feeling. So today's presentation was created in conjunction with Primrose Hospice. Obviously, as you can tell, we're in the south of the county and um, Primrose um, provides a lot of services for the north alongside Kemp Hospice as well. And we'll be sharing their specific details later in the presentation. This is just a little bit about Primrose Hospice and we will be emailing this presentation out to you so you can have a read through these details later. So our objectives for today, we really want to have just a bit of an open look at, at COVID-19 and the impact it has had on children and specifically on bereaved children. We want to look a little bit about how to support bereaved children and provide you with some useful resources and links which you can use in your practice. And then lastly, we want to look at our referral process and how and when to make that referral. So I'm sure this is some of the images we've all been used to see in the past couple of months. Um, it's unprecedented times, as is a common way of describing it. Um, there's been a massive amount of intense media coverage. As you can see here, the sort of headlines that we're not used to seeing, a lot of conversation around death and dying. Also, all our new guidelines and rules were required to stay at home, wash our hands more often, lots of new things that restrict our, our daily routines and our ways of living. And this is quite scary as, as an adult to take all of this in. But really, we want today to have a little look and think about what this looks like to a child and how they interpret this. I think it's really hard to try and understand something that's so invisible can have such a massive effect and completely shatter our, our normal routines. So looking specifically at the impact of COVID-19 on children, I quite like this quote, angry, fed up and isolated. Um, I don't know about yourselves, but I definitely think it describes a lot of us and not just children um, during these times. Um, but particularly looking at children, I think some of these, as teachers, you will relate to massively, um, particularly the first one, school closure, closures and that associated change of routine. It's been absolutely massive. Um, as we know, children attend school for a large amount of their day, spending time with yourselves, and all of that has been taken away in that structure. And alongside that reduced socialization, not being able to see friends as much as they would as they at school, and also that chance just to talk with someone their own age. There's a lot of increased worry and anxiety um, in, in children, and a lot of that is provoked by the media. And not being able to see grandparents or other family members, those significant people in children's lives um, who they aren't able to see. I know we're finding with a lot of work with our teenagers, they're questioning their impact on schoolwork and exams and really questioning what does this mean for my future. And unfortunately, um, as we know from the news reports and, and we've seen it within our work, there is an increased risk of abuse with everyone being at home and that those tensions building up with those restrictions. And then unusually for children, there's concern for parents' health and potentially concern for their parents' jobs as well. Furlough is, is a new word really to a lot of children and it's adding that layer of security for their, for their parents as well. There's an impact on separated families and families who are co-parenting. Who will the child live with? How does that contact remain in place? It's just a lot of considerations to take in. And also, we're looking at the impact on children with learning disabilities also. And my colleague Andy Schwab is going to run through that a bit later in the presentation. And today, really, we're going to have a look at all these things and the impact um, it has specifically on bereaved children. And it's just to know, we don't have the answers. This is all very new. But just from our experience and the work that we do, we want to provide just a little bit of advice so we think how things they benefit going forward. So I'm going to pass over to my colleague Andy Schwab who's going to take us through the next few slides. Okay, I'll, I know that Andy is here. You're with us two minutes. Good morning, can everybody hear? Laura, yes. if you can hear me. I can hear you, thank you. Excellent. <laughs> 
Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out, as it were. Um, my name is Andy Schwab. I'm a social worker at uh, St. Richard's Hospice. Um, and the opening quote that, that we have here is one from Winston's Wish, which is a charity based in Gloucestershire. Um, when Mummy died, I felt as if I'd been hit in the tummy by a car. If I hadn't been told she would die, I would have felt that I'd been hit in the tummy by a bus. And that is, I think, in a great, a powerful quote. Um, but I think it depends on how you use it as to how useful it can be. Now, an awful lot of the people that we support through St. Richard's Hospice, not necessarily with COVID, but across the board, will we'll, we'll say things like, well, I can't stop what's happening from happening. So how can we plan for that? Um, and my response was always to, I, I, I look at it for the example of any other massive event that's going to happen, um, be it a birth, be it a wedding, be it moving house, be it changing jobs. So for example, um, I, I have a daughter, and um, when I knew I was having a daughter, I uh, went to NCT classes and I went to like all the baby shops and you shop for it and stuff like that. Now, when I was handed the child, I still went, <laughs> didn't know what to do. Lots of panic. However, if I hadn't have had that information in advance and been handed a child, I can guarantee you that my response wouldn't have been as good. Maybe absolutely blown away by a lot of the responses that children have to these things. But what, what I think we can evidence to you today is that preparation for these things can be really, really supportive for children. Um, could we have the uh, next slide, please? Okay, so we'll look at um, some of the effects that, that, that um, bereavement can have on children, both pre and post bereavement. A lot of people are surprised to find out that um, this can lead to physical difficulties. Um, things like sleeping difficulties, stomach aches, headaches, um, nausea, things like that. All results of the anxiety that both pre and post bereavement can have in children. Emotions can be very, very variable. Um, moods can be all over the shop, outbursts, not showing emotions. And children also do something called puddle jumping. A puddle jumping is not um, quite what you might imagine. What it means is that children, both pre and post bereavement, will jump in and out of their grief. So a lot of people will tell you that there are stages of grief you'll hear about, you know, bargaining, anger, and all of those things. Um, whereas children might have a couple of good days and then they'll have a couple of days when, when they're not having those things at all. Now you'd be absolutely astounded by the sheer volume of children who kind of appear to have no response to these things whatsoever. Whereas in truth, they're just having a bit of time to process the information. We can also expect to see changes in behavior, um, sometimes better behavior, sometimes what we would call worse, maybe more argumentative, more emotional, more challenging. We might see regression, we might see loss of skills as well. So for example, we might see um, uh, differences in the way a child behaves and uh, performs with their schoolwork, for example. And um, from spiritual stuff, you might see children sort of um, uh, questioning whatever faith they have, whatever faith they've been brought up with. You might find some level of social withdrawing. Children just want, uh, a child just wants to be on their own. Um, and educational, you might find a lack of motivation, low attention span, things like that. It's really important to remember that at times of grief, uh, bereavement, stress, anything like that, um, any response a child has, if you see it as normal, you'll probably have a more chance of supporting that child effectively. So we're looking, at open, we're looking for open and honest communication. The child needs to know that nobody's to blame what's going on. I have no understanding as to why, but a child's organic response to something bad happening to them is to look at themselves and see if there's anything they could have done differently. Maybe to make sure that our support is age appropriate and that our expression of feelings we give the child a safe place to talk, to discuss what they're feeling. They might not want it, but it's important that they know it's there. Um, there's a lot of memory work and things like that, but I'm sure Laura and Rebecca will talk to you more about that. Um, and uh, ch children who have these things in place do tend to have better uh, outcomes. And the, the, the research has shown us that. So in terms of children with learning disabilities, cognitive disabilities, autistic spectrum conditions and things like that, a lot of the themes when children are finding things difficult, particularly if a child's maybe come from a foster care environment, a care home, 
things that are sort of connected with having such disabilities. It's very, very important for children with these disabilities, and I think this spreads into neurotypical children as well, is the ability to be able to control and predict their environment, okay? So there's an importance on structure. There's an importance of sameness, consistency, knowing what's gonna happen, knowing what's not going to happen, what time am I getting somewhere, what time am I going home, where am I sitting at lunchtime, what am I eating, all of those things. Children rely very, very much on structure. We all do. Now there is very few things that are as disruptive as grief and, bereave grief and bereavement or a death anytime, particularly in times of COVID-19. So what we have to do when we're supporting children is, is control the controllable, focus on what we can do, not what we can't do. Because it's the easiest thing in the world when we're supporting a child who's just been bereaved I mean, I know most of you are children, uh, uh, but most of you teach children. Um, we're social workers. I'm sure there are uh, parents, uncles, aunties, brothers, sisters, grandparents watching this right now. And social workers and teachers. And, and as, a, as a result, you're hardwired to protect, you're hardwired to care, and you're hardwired to kind of hide things from children if they're potentially harmful. The, re the, the reality of it is that we can't do that here. So in terms of our ability to control and predict our environment, what we do is we look at that child's life as a whole, okay? Now, at the time of, of somebody dying, we do have the sense of loss, we do have the sense of grief, we do have the sense of bereavement, but what we also have is the sense of chaos, of loss of our routine, loss of our structure and all of those things. Now I know at a time of like this, when you're supporting a child, you kind of go, oh my God, it's so sad, I really empathize, what am I going to do? The reality is that the, the, the kindest gift you can give a child at a time of uncertainty and chaos is structure and routine. That's why so many children make the decision the day after a family member's died that they want to go back to school because they want that normality. They want something that they know. And everybody has that when you think about it. If you look at COVID-19 at the moment, you speak to an awful lot of people and say, oh, I'd give anything to have you know, an afternoon in a beer garden or go to the cinema or a trip to the theatre or something like that, something normal. I'm not hearing many people say, oh, I'd give anything for a two-week all-inclusive trip to Honolulu right at the moment. Because it's a time of chaos, it's a time of uncertainty, and as a direct result of that, people are craving normality. And children are no different. So if we can offer that normality and that structure, at times like this, we have a significantly increased time, uh, opportunity to support a child um, with their grief and bereavement. So can we uh, hide details and protect the person from them? No, we absolutely can't. What we can do is promote consistency of message. So what I, I would always recommend you do, particularly when you're supporting a child with a learning disability or autism, is make sure that our message is consistent. If we're saying that we want normality and structure and consistency in life, then we need that with communication as well. So whilst we've made recommendations about how you'd support a child, what we have to do is make sure that we're saying the same things to parents, the parents are saying the same things to each other, the teachers are saying the same things to the social workers, etc. Because what's really, really harmful for a child at a time like this is to find out that information from somewhere else or to find it out in the wrong way or find out in a way that's unpleasant. Um, so what we do is we make the implicit explicit with our language, which I think there's a, that people always think that if they're using explicit language, they can't deliver their message compassionately and that isn't the case. So, for example, if you said something along the lines of, um, I'm really sorry, uh, your granddad has died, um, his heart has stopped working, the doctors did everything they could to bring him back to life, but they couldn't and he's died. That's an explicit message. It's an accurate message. And it was also delivered compassionately. So with our language, we avoid things like um, passed away. Um, if somebody's gone away they can come back if they've fallen asleep they can wake up um, if we've lost somebody we might be able to found, find them again so we use words like died it's a word that we shouldn't shy away from we make the implicit explicit but we ensure 
that our delivery of message is done compassionately, empathetically, but it's, it's explicit, it's clear, and there's no lack of clarity. Because if there's lack of clarity, a child has a tendency to speculate, and if they speculate, they'll get things wrong. They create a vacuum and cause more problems for the child. So that, can be, that message can be delivered explicitly. We avoid that uh, uncertainty in our vocabulary. We highlight the importance in retaining of structure. Children need that. You'd be amazed. I mean, for example, we run um, day after death meetings on our inpatient unit where family members will come the day after the death or maybe two days after the death and will support the funeral and things like that. You'd be amazed the amount of people who, for example, have lost a husband or a wife and turn up to that day after death meeting um, without their wedding ring on because they've had time to process what's going to happen. They've had time to think about the bereavement that they're going through. So when somebody actually dies, they're a significant way along the bereavement path. They've had time to think about it. They've had time to process it. So that's why we promote a message of clarity to children. Because ultimately, they're going to find out these things anyway. Um, so, um, so that's our responses. And maybe an explanation or evidence of, of what death actually is. Um, I certainly know of many children with autistic spectrum conditions that have actually physically needed to see a body of somebody to understand death. Because death is conceptual and some people learn by seeing things, by viewing things. So we need to sort of have a look at how, how we actually get that individual to understand that the person's died. Um, and that's how, that, that's how we're open about these things. So to conclude, we kind of, uh, it's an importance on structure, it's importance on clarity and explicitness of our message and an importance to keep things normal where the child wants that. Um, and I believe that's everything from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, for that. So considering what Andy has spoken about and that importance of preparation and, and how someone can be further along the bereavement process if they have more information, when we're really looking at COVID-19 and bereavement, it, it blows it out of the water, really. There's been very little preparation for what COVID is. And when we wanted to look at COVID-19 and bereavement, we wanted to look at it as a whole. And we really found that it has to be split into three areas, really. There's those children who have been bereaved prior to COVID-19, those children who have been bereaved during COVID-19, and those who have been bereaved from the virus specifically. So for the next few slides, we're just going to run through some of the considerations um, for these three areas. For those children bereaved prior to COVID-19, again, that increased media of death and dying is, is really coming into play. When we work with children or teenagers, we find that even watching a movie that has a death in it or hearing a certain song can really evoke a lot of emotion. So right now, it's, it's unimaginable having it coming in from all these streams, whether it's on the television, on the radio or on their social media feeds. And that constant reminder. We're both finding as well that when a child is bereaved, Having that support network around you is really important, someone to take comfort in, and that's where reduced visiting is, is really having an impact. We find that children who are bereaved as well can begin to question their mortality and the mortality of those around them. If, say, a child is bereaved of a parent, they will question if the remaining parent will, will die. And that is a normal response. But then to add COVID-19 on top of that, which almost feels like a, a, a more real and intense threat. How, how does that play into it? And these are things that we, we're finding out through our practice at the moment. And then again, the removal of routine. It, you know, those things that we do, we know Gran's going to pick us up from school. We know that we're going to play football at the weekend with our friends and things that give us distraction and give a bit of comfort. They've all been taken away. So those four ideas really provide a structure and, and a way of helping to move through the grief process that COVID-19 has just changed all of that. So then looking at those who have been bereaved during COVID-19, not necessarily from the virus, but have experienced a death of a loved one during this time. 
Again, we're seeing things like social distancing. In those immediate few days after the death, having someone around you, having a hug is so important. And again, that's been taken away. Also, the intense media coverage makes it feel like there's no escaping from it either. And with this one here, lack of specialness, it can sound a bit strange to say that about a death, but really with the amount of media coverage going on with COVID-19 and all the conversation, someone might feel that their loved one's death could be overshadowed by COVID-19. And then most importantly, the absence of rituals. This is something that we have seen a massive effect on children and families and, and adults. Not being able to have a funeral as they may have wanted has been unimaginable and caused so much additional distress. Having a funeral can act as a sense of closure, a sense to be with your loved ones and to celebrate someone's life. Not being able to have it say the way they wanted with as many people. We, we've seen the, the pictures of crematoriums with very few attendees. We've heard as low as five. I think it's starting to improve, maybe a bit more now, but that is still a very low amount. And we're finding that a conversation we normally have in our work is whether a child should attend a funeral or not. And we found that that's a choice and a conversation. The research tells us the children who are able to attend funerals do have a sense of closure and a sense of inclusion in the day. But that choice has been completely taken away. With those reduced numbers at funerals, it's very unlikely a child will be one of those attending. So we're really looking at ways within our work, how we can help families to mark the day for those children, whether that's lighting a candle, saying a poem, and finding quite creative ways so a child can feel that sense of inclusion. And then we move on to the final slide in this section, which is bereaved from COVID-19. Now again, this is very new, and we are still seeing and will continue to see the impact COVID has had on bereavement. I think it's safe to say we're going to be looking at very complicated grief for those who have been bereaved from the virus. And this has been taken from Winston's Wish, who have a great website and great resources. And they've looked at the following areas to see what they think is happening and what we're starting to see within our work. So again, you've got the the social distancing, the impact of that, the fear and the separation and the lack of support structures. We've got that lack of specialness and the absence of rituals. But really to note from COVID and, and what we're finding is that unpredictability and that suddenness of this type of bereavement. And also the idea that some deaths could be premature. So we don't have any specific advice on, on how to support those bereaved from COVID-19, what we can do is we can take the information we have, which Andy has covered and Rebecca will continue to cover in this presentation, and try and adapt it with the consideration that this is new territory for all of us. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Rebecca Sparks, um, my colleague. We've looked a lot at bereavement in children and also the impact of COVID. But we want the second part of our presentation to really focus on how can we practically support these children and maybe some ideas and looking at different ages and stages and the impact that has. So I will pass over to Rebecca for the next section. Thank you, Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, my, like Laura's already lovely, um, introduced me lovely, um, in a lovely way, but my name is Rebecca Sparks. I am also one of the social workers uh, at the hospice. And, and like Laura says, I'll be sort of looking at ways, um, you know, uh, that we can support children, trying to adapt what we already know works for bereaved children, but then looking at, you know, how can we adapt that to uh, support children who are bereaved during this period of time, uh, which is incredibly challenging. Um, this is a lovely quote from the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network um, that talks about, it says, this is a scary time for everyone especially children and young people. Oh, can you hear me better now? I can't see a thumbs up for anyone. But... 
Is it better? I'll hold my microphone next to my, uh, my mouth. Um, so this is a scary time for everyone, especially children and young people. Children need adults to help them understand what's going on and to help them talk about what frightens them and to help reassure them. So that's a lovely quote and, and sort of moves um, quite lovely into my next slide. Um, again, another quote. Um, what I'm going to be talking about in this next few slides is about ages and stages and, and what we look at when, when we are supporting children and young people and um, you know, what, how different ages uh, impacts on how they, they're grieving. Um, this quote, again from the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network, says the best thing to do is uh, give children honest, age-appropriate information about death. Helping children understand death and grief will vary depending on the child's age and development stage. Um, now, I'm sure that all of you will already be aware. Obviously, it is important to remember that what I'm talking about now will be a rough guideline, uh, rough guide. And um, children, of course, develop um, faster or slower depending on their situation and their circumstances. So, you know, take my information. You know, not with a pinch of salt, but you know, it can be flexible. Um, so, yeah, next slide, Laura, please. Um, so we're looking at sort of three to five year olds um, and before I even start again I probably should have talked about this in my, uh, my, my slide previously but like Andy said earlier um, what we often encourage people to do it doesn't matter what age a child is but it's always to speak with parents um, you know to find out what does the child already know you know what do you how do you want me to support your child in school or whatever wherever it might be and um, what we often find is that children will ask questions and I've heard many teachers that I've spoken to and supported uh, you know who might say you know that children are asking you know, questions that they don't know how to answer um, or you know sometimes it can be quite a, a direct question and that can be really difficult to know what to do with um, and we always suggest number one talk to parents um, about the situation but then also answer age appropriately and, and not to overwhelm children with too much information. So we want people to be very open and honest, but we don't want you know, children to be overwhelmed. So we might often talk about uh, giving information in bite, you know, small little chunks, um, just to make sure that children are sort of able to process the information that they're receiving. So going on to the sort of younger, younger years, so three to five years, um, this is some, these are some of the things that we are noticing. Um, so, the, you know, when they're sort of between three and five, they might not be able to fully understand that death is irreversible. So they will have a little bit of an understanding of death, but not a full. Um, rituals is uh, incredibly important for, ch for children of this age to help cement what's happened. And this might be several events. So it might not only be the funeral, but it might be other things to mark that event. Now, you'll notice a theme, and we've mentioned it previously, um, throughout all the ages and stages, rituals are incredibly important. So, like Laura said previously, finding different ways when children aren't able to attend funerals is really, really important. Um, whether that is, you know, um, getting children involved, laying something, you know, giving some, you know, a person who's attending a funeral something to put by the coffin. You know, there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, but yeah, I think it is just important to remember, uh, you know, the importance of rituals. Um, a child of this age might also be talking about the dead person. So for parents and, and for adults, that can be incredibly difficult. Um, it talks about here often that lack of synchronicity between parents and child's grief patterns. And, and Andy talked previously about that puddle jumping. You know, children often go in and out of their grief. So one minute they're really happy and the next they're really sad. Uh, and, and parents who are grieving can find that incredibly difficult. You know, we're talking about a, a person and they're reminding them of, of maybe a, something that they're struggling with themselves. If it's a, the loss of a parent, uh, it's not unusual for a child to seek out replacement parents. Um, they might be to a school teacher or a teaching assistant, you know, you might get the question, will you be my new mummy or will you be my new daddy? You know, we hear that quite often. Um, Sleep problems can be, um, be normal for children of this sort of age. Uh, magical thinking. So I, Andy briefly touched on this earlier, but thinking about, um, you know, children often worry that what they've done, that they're directly responsible for their, 
uh, their loved one's death. So something that they've done or, or you know, something they've said and that's resulted in, in that person dying. Um, and I think this is important that these children are given uh, the language and emotional context that they can use to communicate about the person who has died. So uh, it's all about giving that uh, direct information, avoiding the sleep and um, or losing someone and just being very uh, open and honest with that child in an age-appropriate way. So looking at the next sort of stage, it's about uh, roughly between six and eight year olds. Um, I briefly mentioned this on, on the previous slide, but you know, they might say and act as they feel. They're very outspoken, you know, asking direct questions, sometimes incredibly difficult questions to answer perhaps. Um, but we often, like I said previously, it's just about being open and honest. Um, and, and it's okay to say, I don't know, or that you will go and find out. You know, it's fine to say that. I think often, um, you know, it's our re reaction and our response, our natural response to, to want to give an answer, but sometimes we might not know, and it's okay to say that to a child. You know, I don't know, but I'll try to find out. Um, separation anxiety might be a, a big one, particularly if you lost a parent, um, you know, leaving you know, it will be that worry about maybe the other person might die as well um, crying um, is obviously common um, you know maybe having some physical uh, symptoms as well of their grief um, you know concern for security yourself and others so that's when i talked about you know they might worry about other people around them dying or they're starting to realize you know that they themselves might die and and certainly during this this situation that we're experiencing at the moment um you know, obviously that's becoming more real for children. They're hearing more about death or dying and, and, and they're sort of realizing that or, or worrying that, that they might die. Um, and that's incredibly hard. So it's, it's offering that reassurance. Um, they might talk to the dead person uh, and that's completely normal. You know, possessions are important. So later on, I'll talk about some of the things that we might do with children and uh, memory work that we'll do. Um, and that's really important and, and really helpful for children of this age. Um, and they enjoy remembering, they enjoy thinking about their uh, loved one who's died. Uh, they, might, they might feel happy thinking about, you know, happy memories. Um, and and you know, at the bottom of the slide obviously says that children will need some, someone to clarify thoughts and feelings and reframe events and build self-esteem. Um, so if we're looking at sort of um, our, uh, nine to 11 year olds, um, again, I mean, they all sort of uh, go within, you know, in hand in hand with each other, but reactions can be really intense. Um, you know, uh, the need for, to participate in rituals. Um, so if that's not a funeral, what can that be? Can you do something at home, you know, to mark an event? Uh, fears of other losses. Uh, that, you know, when I, when I talk about fears of other losses, I don't on, only talk about the possibility of other people dying, but it could be losses. So uh, it might be moving schools or it might be losing friends, you know, it could be anything like that. And of course, with the situation at the moment, a lot of children are, are actually, these fears are reinforced, they're actually reality at the moment. So adding, you know, COVID to someone who's already been bereaved is incredibly difficult. Um, schools are very important, you know, the learning, the routines, uh, you know, children of this age, you know, they need that. Uh, and obviously not having that at the moment is, is, it can be difficult. They might be worried about self or others. Um, you know, they might identify with a person who's died. Um, they might have anger and aggression. That's not unusual. So you, your feelings are coming out in behavior. Um, they might find it difficult to concentrate in, in school. We often hear that, um, you know, that, you know, trying to focus on school when you've got so many things in your mind can be incredibly difficult. Um, Limit setting is important, so those routines, um, so you know, making sure that you have those routines and actually there's some rules and boundaries. So someone might be grieving, but that doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't have the routines and, and, and rules in place. Uh, and um, you know, that's what it talks about at the bottom, you know, these children need information and structured opportunities for emotional expression. Um, so between 12 and 14, um, again, participation in, in funeral rituals is really important, not only attending, but being able to contribute, being able to maybe make decisions about songs being played. Um, so although someone might not be able to attend the funeral now, you know, they can still be involved in, in planning that funeral. It might be limited what you can do, depending on the situation. 
but they can still be involved. Um, some of these children might grieve in private, so that you might, you know, it might seem like they're getting on with life a bit on the inside. They might be feeling really sad, or it might be when they go home and they're in their bedroom. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's normal um, for children of this age to feel sad, um, you know, particularly in relation to COVID as well. You know, children of so 12, 14, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that they're missing out on there. Um, they're not able to see friends. They might uh, not be able to attend sports events, you know, musical events. All of these things are impacting on a child's normal life. And it's another loss that they're experiencing. Um, they might be resistant to talking about uh, the person who's died. Um, they might, uh, again, displacement, anger, uh, or, or maybe feel like they need to be strong. You know, they can't show that they're feeling sad. Um, they might identify with the person who's, who's died, um, but also they need to have that help with setting limits and new relationships with this. So if it's a parent who's died, you know, uh, Laura mentioned it earlier in the presentation, you know, it can be really difficult for a child, you know, who's not only lost their, um, their parents, but then trying to work out what their surviving parent, what is their relationship going to be like, you know, um, it might have been the person who's died, it's the person who set the rules in the house. So it's working out all of those things uh, whilst also trying to grieve. Schools and peers are, are very important um, for, for, for teenagers. Um, and if we're looking at the next uh, sort of age group, which is the final age group that I'll talk about, which is sort of, we're coming into sort of later teenage years. Um, so these sort of teenagers might be a bit more adult in the, that they, the way that they're mourning. Uh, you know, they, um, they might come across as thoughtful and realistic a person. So if someone is, you know, uh, going to die, they might be more realistic about it. Uh, but in terms of the, um, you know, the mourning, mourning process, uh, it's also important to, to remember that they're still teenagers. So um, they can be quite intense. The, you know, feelings can be overwhelmed with their feelings. You know, they might have all of these emotions, but don't know how to cope with them fully. Um, might be angry um, you know they might be a, uh, aiming anger at a surviving parent or um, a loved one and it's got nothing to do with them they're just sort of getting that anger out at them and that's normal um, you know and they're able to mourn the person as a, an individual um, but they might also be concerned about living up to expectations so it might be expectations of the person who's died you know wanting to do well in their um, GCSEs or A-levels or wherever it might be and sometimes teenagers can feel quite overwhelmed by that. Um, they might you know, idolise the, the person who's died uh, and that sometimes can be really difficult for parents to cope with. Uh, you know the surviving parent um, if, it's a, if it's a parent loss um, you know that, that they're idolising this, this person who's died and, that, uh, and, and maybe being quite angry with the, the surviving parent. Um, I think it's important for uh, children of this age, you know, for, for us as, as workers and teachers and parents to respect their views and allow them to express their feelings. Um, but also that it's okay if they don't want to talk about their feelings, allow them space. It's just making sure that they know what's, what's you know, available for them and that they can talk. And I think, you know, in terms of relation to, to COVID, you know, what we're finding is that children are finding it incredible, teenagers are finding it incredibly difficult. You know, they might be acting out, uh, they might reduce connection, their, their connections with other people, so their peers, and they might not want to talk to their family, you know, so they're isolating themselves even further than, than what they would have normally needed to. Um, and, and we're finding that quite a challenge, and, you know, um, so those are the things that we are working on. Uh, alongside at the moment. Um, so some of the things uh, that we might do, uh, Laura, if you want, that's it, um, is just thinking about some of the things that we do. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about all of these activities that we might do. There's some lovely resources online uh, that you can Google or just find out. Uh, but I mentioned previously about the importance of, of memory work and, and having the opportunity to, to talk about feelings and, and all of those aspects. So these are some of the things that we, we might do with, with children and young people. So it's things like writing a letter um, or creating sort of salt jars could be relating to, to feelings or memories. 
uh, we might like write little cards where they have memories of, of their loved ones, where they write things down. Um, we might make a memory book, a, scrap, a scrapbook, with photos and uh, information about the person who's died in memory boxes. And those are things that they can keep for a long time. So even you know, in 20 years time, they'll be able to go back to those things and, and think about some of the happy memories that they have with, that, you know, with their loved one and reminding them. Um, the other things that we do is lots of worksheets and workbooks, photo frames, uh, again, linked to memories, dream catchers, you know, if children are finding it difficult to sleep. Um, uh, and that includes, you know, worry dolls might help for sleeping as well. You know, being worry dolls or worry monsters, you know, where children can, you know, tell their dolls, you know, their worries so they can write a little worry down and the, the worry monster will eat it. Um, so those are some of the things that, that we do, but you can find lots of information online uh, on some of the resources that Laura will have put down at the end of this presentation. Uh, there's lots out there to support you as, uh, as schools um, to help children. So we've already talked about some of these things and um, so some of the things that we need to consider during the COVID-19 uh, situation. You know, the importance of marking a day if your child can't attend the funeral. So whatever that is, you know, doing something at home, lighting a candle or uh, eating that person's favourite meal. It's just something, you know, to make sure that that child gets the opportunity to say goodbye to their loved one, because that's a really important aspects that in for the child's grieving process they need to have the opportunity to say goodbye and and our schools you can you can support um children you know uh, particularly bearing in mind you know if they have had a uh, had a um you know someone die uh, it's just being mindful i think of you know funerals so a child might come back the next day you know they might be straight into school because that's you know their safe space and where they feel comfortable um but actually being mindful at some point later on in the future, there will be a funeral. And at, actually at the moment with what's going on with, uh, with COVID-19, you know, there might be a funeral at the moment, but most people seem to be delaying things a little bit. So they're actually having a memorial uh, later on in the year, you know, when the lockdown has eased, when the families can get together. Uh, so there is a possibility of uh, maybe almost like a delayed grief, grieving process uh, for some of these children and families. Um, the importance of creating a sense of technology, um, uh, via, you know, connection via technology. So I saw someone uh, commenting uh, in the chat about um, obviously some funerals being live streamed. Um, part of um, you know, creating a sense of connection, of course, that could be the funeral if families feel so that's appropriate. Uh, you know, it's, I would, I would probably, you know, sort of explore that a bit more with the families. Um, but it's a really positive way that people can still feel connected. Um, reassuring children that no one is to blame. You know, I've mentioned this briefly before, you know, that magical thinking. Um, but even with this whole uh, COVID situation, of course, with, with, you know, children are um, often talking, you know, washing their hands and saving lives. And children where there might be a parent who's died from COVID might be wondering, have I done anything? Have I not washed my hands enough to, to cause this? So it's trying to reassure children that they are not to blame um, because it's an easy, you know, often children will go into that sort of um, situation. Um, maintaining routine as much as possible. So even if a child isn't going to school, how can, you know, what routines can be put in place in school or when they're going back to school, possibly some in, in a couple of weeks time, you know, what routines can be put in place so that child is coping through this situation um, and prioritizing open and honest communication. I think that's key to everything that we talk about today. Uh, it's just about communication. I think what we need to remember is that children are only not only experiencing you know um the loss of a loved one or you know a loved one dying they're experiencing a number of losses um and that's incredibly difficult um so yeah just something to bear in mind so the next slide um that i uh, wanted to talk to was uh, a little bit about um red flags uh, to identify bereaved children at risk so not always um you know, will children, you know, most children will grieve in a normal pattern, but there are some things that um, 
might sort of give you a red flag where you might be worrying about a child you might feel like actually they need some additional support you know what can we do to put put this in place so that might be persistent difficulties in talking about the dead child or the ill parent you know if it's someone who's poorly um it might be you know uncontainable and persistent aggression they might be really angry uh, you know they might be taking that out on their family and friends um you know they might have persistent symptoms of anxiety or they don't want to go to school or or that extreme clinging so that's attachment isn't it not wanting their parent or carer to be separated from them uh, they might have some physical complaints with stomach aches and, and those sort of things um, they might have sleeping di sleep difficulties or nightmares you know prolonged you know so long after a, a person has died uh, it's not unusual i wouldn't say a red flag if someone has a nightmare when something has recently happened that's not unusual but if it continues to happen and it's having a negative impact on that child um, maybe changes in eating patterns so that could be under eating or overeating um, maybe um, you know social withdrawal so not wanting to talk to uh, their um, friends or their family and that's prolonged and, and, and again having a negative impact on that child um, difficulties in school or a serious decline in ac academic performance now it might be uh, after a few months now nine months is very specific but you know uh, it's just I mean you as, as, as teachers and teaching assistants and whoever we got in the uh, attending today uh, but you will have a good idea what's normal for that child you know if you're noticing a significant decline in their performance that might be a red flag for you they might persistently blame themselves um, or feeling guilty and uh, that could be obviously that could be indicative of the, something like depression that does not necessarily have to be um, the self-destructive behavior as well or a desire to die so that might you know talking about self-harm those sort of uh, behaviors um, and, and that's when you might want to think about some a child needs some additional bereavement support um, so the next slide that I wanted to talk about, we created a little flow chart to make it a little bit easier. I think um, you know we talked about a lot of information. So in terms of if you identify someone as having red flags as a bereaved child, um, then you might want to talk with the child and their parent or carer about support in school. So based on what we talked to uh, about uh, today, you might feel like you can offer some of that support in school, depending on your situation and what support services you've got in school. Uh, so you might want to create a plan with that, a child and a parent or carer um, to look at that. Uh, but if the, the child still continues to show those red flags or behaviours, that might be when you want to look at uh, making a referral to a bereavement support service or, uh, and or uh, encourage the parent or carer to speak to, uh, with their GP as well. So it, might be, it could be a combination of those two as well. So it doesn't have to be one or the other, it could be both. Um, so that's, that, that's me. Um, I'm going to pass over to Laura uh, again to uh, talk about how to make referrals to the different services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was really good to run through just the specific ages and stages and potentially, you know, we have a lot of different schools here and, and hopefully those age groups could answer some of the questions you may have. Um, but really, if we get to the point where you're considering a referral to a service such as ourselves would be helpful. Um, I just want to run through a couple of things about that. So for our service at St Richard's and Bereavement Support South Worcestershire, um, we can have a direct referral. I've included our direct number here on the screen. Um, and we'd want that to happen after a conversation with both the child and the parent. Um, it needs to be something that a child wants to engage in and wants to access support. Um, so, so we can progress with the referral as well. And we find that particularly with teenagers. Um, and really just to um, note that it must have a South Worcestershire DP to be referred into our service if they aren't connected to the hospice already. So for the north of the county, um, again, we have a Primrose Hospice here and they have some information here on how to make contact with themselves. Um, we also have Kemp Hospice um, in the north as well, and our next slide will give a few of those details. Um, don't worry about trying to write any of this down, we will email out everyone the presentation after we're finished today. 
So here are some more uh, local bereavement services. Um, as you can see, some of them are specific areas, um, but we do have footsteps um, who are at Worcestershire wide as well. And here are some national bereavement services as well that you can access. Um, I'm particularly noting Winston's Wish as well, have, as we've mentioned before, have a great resources um, to make use of. And Child Bereavement UK have also produced a lot of um, material for schools specifically, so it'd be worth checking out their websites. We wanted to provide you with some specific um, resources which we've had a little look through and think are quite useful. Um, obviously we'll be led by yourself as well, um, but there's a COVID-19 book uh, for children, um, which might be a good way of explaining the situation. Um, some lesson plans as well around grief um, and how that can be included. Um, Child Bereavement UK, as I said, they've created specific webinars for different age groups and different schools. And they've also um, have a growing in grief awareness framework, which can be used as an audit tool for schools to mark themselves against. And here we just have some more as well, which you can be able to access and have a little look through um, in your own time. This is one um, resource that we did want to look at in a little bit more detail. We thought it was quite a good resource um, for children and teachers or teaching assistants, whoever it is, to use. Um, often we find ha having these conversations and starting them can be quite difficult. So having a prompt there is really useful. And this one could be used online, it has tick boxes, or it could be printed, <laughs> printed out and ticked. Um, but it's a way of um, children maybe putting into words or um, down on the page what kind of support they would like if they're going to have difficulty voicing that. Um, so this is just a little bit of um, a tool that you can use. So right now um, we've, we've done most of our presentation and um, we have a lovely video here from the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust which we want to show you. Uh, we feel like encompasses a lot of what we've been saying. Um, so bear with me while I get that up and running. Um, but just a little bit of a pre-warning, it is a little bit emotional. So if you need to take a little moment, please do. Um, but I will get that up and running now. If Rebecca and Andy could give me a thumbs up to make sure you can hear it when it plays. Saying goodbye when someone special dies. The world feels very different right now. I can't leave my house. I can't see my friends. I can't go to school. And I am feeling sad. Someone very special to me died yesterday. When my mum told me, she gave me the tightest, longest hug. I knew this special person was in hospital sick, but I didn't think they would die. The doctors and nurses did everything they could to try and make them better. Mum said they try really hard. I wished I could have gone to the hospital to say goodbye, but I wasn't allowed. Mum and Dad couldn't go either. We were all very sad. They were not alone. The kind nurse sat with them and held their hand. The nurse told them how much we all loved them. I wanted to go to the funeral, but I wasn't allowed to do that either. It was all very confusing. I chatted to my mum and dad, and they helped me feel better. We wrote letters, and I drew a picture of the beach. This was their favourite place to be. We cried. I wished I could have hugged them. This was our goodbye. Today we are going to find lots of photos of us having fun together. 
We are going to make a book and fill it with stories about the times we shared together. I miss them so much. Mum told me that when someone dies, they can never come back. But this doesn't mean that I will stop loving them. They will always be very special to me and will live in my heart forever. So thank you everyone for listening to our presentation and watching that video. Um, it even got me a little bit there as well. I'm sure it did you. Um, so our final thoughts really just to end the presentation, um, just, to, just to sign off is really, as we've said multiple times, is using that clear, honest and age appropriate information. We'll find sometimes children will act older than they are in age and sometimes children will re regress and act a bit younger. And, and really what we ask is that it's child-centred. Um, yes, take our information, but really focus on, on the child themselves and what, what they're showing you. Um, and if you can, with, within, within school, if you have that time and that, that support, allow children the time to talk and be listened to. And, and use the resources and books during support as well to help prompt that. And also, try and have a bit of fun whilst remembering. I think it can be easy to think that support is supporting a brave child is going to be really sad and difficult and, and yes it will it might be but when a child's recounting memories say doing some memory work as Rebecca described they can recall some quite funny memories and also that person's sense of humor as well and you can actually just bring a bit of that laughter into it as well which is really important and finally just to be there as, as teachers, teaching assistants, whatever staff we have here today, you have a massive amount of time with these children and children knowing they have your support will, will just be a massive help to them. And our last slide is just a little bit of a reminder. Um, we appreciate you have extremely difficult jobs and the coming months will be difficult. So just to try and look after yourself as much as possible and we have some little tips here which you can read through and a really nice sort of coronavirus anxiety workbook as well um, but just to keep that in mind so thank you very much um, we hope you've enjoyed the presentation today what i'm going to do is i'm going to hand over to sarah who's going to feed back if there's been any questions in the chat she's been keeping an eye on that um, and if there isn't um, many in the chat you feel free to pop your hands up and we can try come round. Uh, we have a bit of time to run through some of the questions. If we don't get a chance uh, to answer yours, please feel free to email me. I popped my email address on here. Um, and also we'll be sending out some evaluations and it would be great to have your feedback from today's training. Um, as you know, this is the first training we have run and we want to make sure it is really suited to yourselves as schools. And um, if you have any suggestions, um, please let us know. Thank you. I'll pass over to Sarah. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, before I go to the questions, I actually uh, just want to say how proud I am of, of these three. How amazing was that? Um, you know, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, Rebecca. A lot of, lot of work has gone into this. Um, and these guys have got a lot of experience. So it's a really good opportunity for um, us to pick their brains a little bit more, perhaps. Um, Laura, can I ask you to lose the presentation so that we can see, oh, there you are. I can see some of you now. Um, the way we're going to do this is I'll read out some of these questions and then if there's something that you'd like to say, something that you'd like to add to, or some experience that you've got, because we've got a wealth of experience in this Zoom today. Um, if you could maybe put your hand up wave to us and, and we'll ask you to unmute yourself. Um, also, there's a very clever little um, doofus, as my mother used to call it, which is the reactions button um, at the bottom of your screen. And I think you can actually click on there. Um, so you've got a wave. So 
I'm way, I don't know how to lose it now I've done it. That's the only problem. But there is, oh, and Andy's got thumbs up as well. So you can use that to get our attention. It goes off automatically after a few seconds. Oh, so it does. Thank goodness for that. The wonders of technology. Um, so uh, some of the questions that we had, um, the one I wanted to pick up on first was, some funerals are being live streamed. Would it be appropriate to let the child watch? Um, and, and Rebecca, you did answer that to an extent by actually saying that it's a conversation with the family, perhaps. Yeah. Um, my, my addition to that is it depends, I guess, on the, side, the age of the child, the experience of the child already. Um, it, sounds, it sounds strange, but our experience is that those children who've had pets and where pets have died, when they're young, have a much better understanding of what death means. I can always remember my five-year-old daughter when the hamster died. She still used to go out and, and put food and water on the, the little grave in the garden. She had absolutely no concept at that age that death meant they weren't coming back. So it does depend on age and stages as well as to whether you do that. And Rebecca, I think, I can't remember if this was you on another Zoom, but I think you said something at one point to me about um, one of your clients watched a funeral via um, virtual, a virtual funeral and was actually really distressed because there was nobody there. Was that you? I don't think it was me, but I, I have heard of that. Not a child. So, I, uh, you know, I think adults watching uh, live streams can, it can be distressing because there's not, the funeral doesn't look like it normally would do. You know, we don't have lots of people there. So what we found, like Laura said, we've had um, the, the lowest amount of number we've had. Actually, we have been told certain funeral no one has been able to attend. But generally, it was five to start off with, and we're now looking at 15 people attending a funeral. So, um when people see, and, and I haven't got loads of experience with it, but I ha have had some feedback that uh, not being able to, um, you know, seeing that no one is there for the funeral in person can be distressing. So it's just something to bear in mind for families if they're thinking about a child uh, doing a live stream or watch, watching a live stream. Uh, but I don't think there is a right and wrong answer. It depends on the child, the family, a little bit like the advice that we would offer if, if parents are asking us if a child should attend a funeral or not. You know, you know, often with a normal funeral, we might say, give the child the option, but you know, I think you need to almost balance it. I think it, it, there is no right and wrong answer. Is, does anybody want to add anything to that? Have any of you got any experience you'd be able to share or any thoughts that you've got? I can't see all the pages, so I'm relying on my team to shout out if they see anybody waving wildly. Um, lady on the iPad on page two with a red top on. Sorry, your name isn't on the iPad. It just says iPad. Would you like to? I've, I'm, I'm muted, you know. Thank you. It's because it's my husband's iPad. Uh, <laughs> they have their uses. The live... <laughs> The live stream can be made available for 28 days afterwards. So it might be worth what, you know, having that facility um, enabled. You have to um, ask for that within three days of the funeral. Okay. Um, because then they can watch with the rest of the family, perhaps. It might be a more supportive way of seeing it, and then they can talk about it together. Thank you. That's really helpful. I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Um, Jodie, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I attended my auntie's funeral near the beginning of lockdown and it did really stress me out that no one was there. There were, there were two people that we could see there um, and me personally. And what we've done in our family is we've agreed that when all this is over and we're allowed to get together, we're going to have like a remembrance ceremony. And I don't know if that's something we could um, give ideas out that we could have some sort of thing with the children where all the family do get together and share happy memories and share stories and look at photos together that are happier um because even though the funeral had to take place at that time which meant no one could go it doesn't mean that that's your only time to say goodbye does it 
absolutely. I think that's a really interesting idea and certainly um, experience I've had over the years is that schools, when there's been a death uh, in a family, they've talked with the family, uh, they've talked with the children and they've taken on board, uh, you know, maybe planting a tree in the grounds in memory of somebody or having a, a plant of some sort or even doing an assembly in remembrance of a person. So it's being able to have those really open conversations and finding something that fits with your school because you all have different um, ideas and needs and also fits with the children and, and, and the family itself. So thank you, that's, that's important, Jodie. I think um, if I could dip in there, it, it, takes, it takes an Im immense amount of wisdom and experience to actually say what, what I think is distressing when you see a funeral that's only got five people at it and actually knowing the difference that this is, that a lot more people would actually want to attend, it's just they can't. Um, and oftentimes it's very difficult to kind of say to somebody, look, I, you know, it's very sad, but it's not your problem. You don't own that. But it, it's really important to consider and, and accept that there are people who would like to be at this funeral. And it's just that they can't be, you know, because of circumstances. And, and we're hearing so many people at the moment who are saying things like that. You know, it is distressing. But when all this is over, we're going to have a memorial and we're going to do this properly. And we're going to give that person the goodbye and the send off that they want and they deserve. Um, and it's it's kind of it's postponed in many ways and not cancelled. It's it's just really important that I think throughout the the, the, the whole of this and, and there's no easy way to do it. It's, it's about ownership of problems and having an understanding of controlling what we can control and accepting the things we can't, um, which is hugely challenging when you're talking about a funeral with only five or eight people at it. Um, but it's important to look on the positives that something can be done. It's just going to have to wait, unfortunately. Yeah. And that's really hard, isn't it? Thank you, Andy. And, and Max has put up on the chat, you probably have seen this, um, which kind of backs up what we're talking about here. She says, my friend passed away. There were only eight people. I personally found it very upsetting that he didn't get the funeral that we would all like to have given him. And absolutely, um, it's, it's just so hard, isn't it? Because even in death, we, uh, those of us who've had children or know people who've had children, we have a birth plan. It can go out the window, but you, you tend to try to have in your head what it is you'd like. Um, and you have the same in death. You know, we work very hard with people to create what we might call a plan for their death. And it's important. And when you can't do that and can't give people that, it has long term impacts with some people and some families. If I could jump in as well. I think that was really important, Josie, what you said about having that. Um, it's, it's not cancelled, it is postponed. And I think, you know, with that, it's maybe having a lot of the talked about today, you know, you have your typical sort of stages of grief and, and we don't necessarily um, think that every child will go through that. They can jump, puddle jump back and forth really. Uh, but we find that we're thinking that with the postponed wakes or celebrations um, of life or whatever families choose to do, that might also postpone a child's grieving process so we could be months down the line and we're seeing behaviours we would have thought we'd have seen sooner and I think that will just tie into that a lot. Yeah. I think that's really important you know I've heard so often um, people don't mean to say it but it just pops out somehow are you back to normal now you know it's just I think people speak because they don't know what else to say and out it comes and then it's, it's all a bit of a disaster. You, you kind of have to appreciate that there's no length of time for this. People will take as long as they take. So I think that's a really important point, Laura. Thank you for picking up on it. Um, okay, is there anything else you want to, to mention on that? Or um, the only thing that I'm, I would like to just plant as a seed in the your head. I'm sorry about that. that. I think that was my dog just got in from his, his walk. Um, is when I did some teaching with schools a number of years ago, there was no um, opportunity from the schools that I was talking with to actually build a policy for bereavement within schools. So there was a process for what you as teachers and teaching staff can go through and actually follow when something like this happens. Um, um, I mean, you don't need to answer me now, but I'm just wondering whether that's something that you have got or whether that's something that you might consider actually doing 
And if you do want to do something like that, if there's any support that I can give you, I'd be very happy to, to help with it, certainly. Some of you may already have it and you may be able to share between each other. That would be good as well. There's some really helpful resources uh, for schools on the Child Bereavement Network website uh, that offers guidelines to uh, schools uh, about uh, supporting bereaved children and it goes through stages and, uh, and processes so they're really helpful in the resources if you wanted to have a look at it it is really helpful um, they got lots of resources on there and uh, so I would definitely obviously we're around if you're wanting any support and advice but also feel free to look online because there's such good information on there I see that Claire has just put up on the chat that she's written a bereavement policy which is supported by the Diocese of Worcester. So that would be really helpful. Thank you, Claire. I'd, if you'd be willing to share that, um, that would be really, really helpful. Um, I, I, can't, I feel free for you guys because, you know, you're teachers. That's what you do and do really well. But you've got to be a social worker. You've got to be a nurse. You've got to be a bereavement counsellor. You've got to be a bit of everything to these children that you're working with and their families as well. It's, it's a massive undertaking. So I do, I admire you for what you do and anything that we can help with, please remember that we're here. Um, uh, there's also on the chat, are there also resources for sixth form students? Um, I mean, teenagers bring their own, their own angst, don't they? And I think at the moment there's, uh, with COVID, with all of this up in the air about going to university, will the universities even be open in September? Um, it's really, really difficult for sixth form students. So uh, if anybody knows of any resources that are out there for sixth form students, then please speak up. That would be really helpful to know. We find that um, sometimes our resources can initially seem maybe like they're aimed at a younger age group and um, we do find we can depending on the child kind of adapt that to an older age group one of the things we, we look at doing is what we call an emotional first aid kit and for a younger child that might include uh, things like um, getting a hug from mum or um, petting my dog and um, going to play football but one way we adapt that for older children is really looking at it like a self-care kit and um, that's quite a, a, a hot topic at the moment is self-care and so if we try and adapt it in a way is it do we do some journaling do we do meditation or you know, what is it that is more appropriate for that age group so if there are any sort of older children that you are thinking maybe six form sort of getting in, in towards that uni stage or, or not um, please uh, get in touch with us and we can try see what resources we can adapt and might be appropriate for for those Thank you, Laura. That's really helpful. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to some of the questions. I mean, as as the as my team were going through the presentation, I was kind of writing some things down that that on the chat that that came up into my head, and one of them is um, uh, it's so hard for the families who are grieving. Um, how much input would school have with supporting the family? So I don't know whether any of you could because that was a question to all of you. I'm very aware that you are there for the children, but I can't help but feel that you're having families pop in and telling you what's happening and, you know, you're busy. How are you, how are you doing that? How will you do that when, when they're all back? Silence. I guess my thoughts are, um, do, you, do you have a set time of day when you're, I don't know, when the classroom is open so people can pop in or does it have to be a set appointment? Um, what space do you have in your day for maybe ringing a family who's asked to have some contact with you? It's all of the, because I don't understand how, how your routine works in school, I'm, I'm interested in, in what you do and how you do that. Jodie? I think that um, during um, lockdown and everything, we've been keeping in touch with a lot of children and families over the phone, haven't we? And I just think when everything does go back to some sort of normality, that's probably something we could maybe carry on doing for the more vulnerable people and say, if, if somebody had lost somebody at the moment and just needed that extra bit of support, 
there could be just 10 minutes every day where someone from that class team could check in with them and give them a heads up and just even just giving the parents um the reassurance that their child is doing okay at school just keep letting them know that you know they've come in and you know they're a bit quiet this morning but they they, they managed to do this that or they're, they're concentrating quite well in lessons and we're really proud of them because when you do lose somebody that's all you think about isn't it but if we can distract them we, we had um, a child that we were supporting that lost his dad before all of this happened um, and it was just keep checking in with the mom and keep letting mom know that he's doing all right he's okay and letting her know that he's 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 still managing to cope with everyday things and, and that's a really good point Jody. but also that if that child isn't doing particularly well or they're not okay that, that that's absolutely fine as well it's about i think a, a lot of the time the reassurance with with children and families and things like that it's about saying yeah no no they're not doing very well at the moment they are struggling they are finding it difficult but that isn't the end of the world i, I think sometimes and we all forget this is how resilient children are particularly at that, those age groups you know you kind of you kind of think to yourself well, you know i really want to protect them from this i really want to make this okay for them but you know they do have a tremendous amount of resilience that i think often we underestimate The one thing that I hear from, you know, when I work with children that they have found really helpful from schools and, you know, when they feel really well supported is when they have a particular person uh, at the school that they know that they can go to to talk to that particular person. So it's, you know, one named uh, worker as such. It doesn't, it could be a tutor, it could be someone working in reception, it could just be whoever, it doesn't have to be a support worker, but as long as they have that one person that they know they can they can go to and they trust if there is anything that they need. Um, that's what I hear from children that they really uh, find helps in school. And also I've, I've heard from um, some of the kids I've been working with is that option of having like a card. Um, I'm not sure if you have a particular name for it. So if a child just feels they need to get out of the class, it's too much just sort of showing a card instead of having to verbally say that. I'm sure you'd probably have to monitor how much that was being used, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a really good resource. And I think just when that anxiety or that grief just suddenly takes over and we can't plan for it and children certainly can't, having that way to get out and maybe having identified place they can go as well would be is really helpful um, so you just encourage something like that as well I do wonder how many amazing ideas we're going to come out of Covid with we've all been forced into this situation of having to work really really differently um, and our processes have changed and we've had to embrace technology far more than we ever were um, and, and something that I've been encouraging my team to do, or I will be encouraging, this might be news to them, that I will be encouraging my team to do is actually to tell me what has worked, to tell me what hasn't worked, and then to come together as a larger organisation to actually look at what we can take forward into our new normal, because it will be a new normal. I, I don't know that we can go back to what we had before in the same way that it, it was. Um, so, and I don't know if that's an opportunity for you within schools as well to kind of really um, drill down into what's, what's going to help all of you and your children and your families going forward. Are there new ways of doing things that um, you actually need to chuck out because it isn't going to happen, it isn't going to work well, and things that you can take forward? Um, you know, certainly with, with sixth form, um, you know, we were talking about sixth form and those older children, a lot of them are very technical savvy already. So what can we link in with as teachers to kind of support them in that way? It isn't necessarily always that face-to-face -face support that they need. It could be uh, something else as well. And certainly that's something Rebecca, Andy and Laura have been working on with teenagers as well. So it is, it is perhaps, even though it's an awful situation, there are some opportunities in there as well. Okay, thank you. Um, right, any, I've, those were the kind of questions that I put in and I think we've covered them. I've got one more, but I'm gonna save that. I'll save the, not the best till last, but the one that I want to uh, maybe ask, I'll save that till last. Um, 
is there anything that you specifically want to ask us as a team? No? Okay. We, we've got a lady, the iPad. Yes, the lady on her husband's iPad. <laughs> what's, what's her, what is your name? <laughs> no, we're going to have to ask. I can't hear you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Felicity. Hello. Um, it's, not, it's not a question, it's um, just some experience. Um, I'm a childminder and five years ago my father died. And last year my daughter lost the baby at 17 weeks. So I've d involved the children in discussing all of that that's gone on. Um, and because they knew my daughter was expecting the baby beforehand. So we've had quite open and detailed conversations about you know, things like how she had to actually deliver the baby and things like this, you know, um, with an eight year old. Um, and then when my father died, the five year old at that time um, was really quite distressed about the thought of him being buried um, and was worried about mud going in his mouth and things like that. But because we could have open conversations, he could say that. And then I could discuss the fact that no, he was in a box and that sort of thing. And I took him to where he'd been um, buried. Um, he was very dis disappointed that he couldn't dig up the coffin to see um, <laughs> and things like that. But it's, it's not being surprised at the things they want to do or the things that they are worried about. Um, it, 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 I could have got really upset. I didn't. Um, my dad had had a long life, you know, this sort of thing. And they'd, been, they'd known him a long while. And why wouldn't they want to know about those sort of things but being open with it in relation to my family hopefully they will then find it a lot easier to talk as and when anything happens in their own families um they, they have since lost a great granddad and we did have a few chats about that but yeah just things like that that they we've got pictures of my um tiny little baby grandson um on around as well so that you know we just include everybody in and picture my dad um so they know they're, they're still in our thoughts and things thank you yeah, just that. just that sort of thing yeah no thank you so much for sharing that because oh gosh there's so much in there i'd like to to um you know sort of build on and, and share with you but i think part of what you're saying is when people have died we take them forward with with us they they you know they're in our hearts and that memory work that that we do and that you will will possibly be doing with children is so important so thank you Felicity, for sharing it and that open, honest conversation, because it's something that um, as a society, we in this in our culture, in, in, in uh, our culture, we, we don't always do very well. It's not our comfort zone, is it? Um, so being able to have those open and honest conversations, it's not always the child's difficulty. It's our difficulty with that because we try to protect children from what we're uncomfortable with and what we think might upset them. So that was so brave what you did and thank you so much for sharing it because I do think that's ever so important. Thank you. I, I think in, in relation to that as well, if, if it's something that we're not used to talking about, you know, looking at what COVID's done, it, it's brought death and dying into the media and into a lot of people's lives. Um, children are being exposed to it a lot younger than, than what we would expect really. And with that kind of magical thinking idea where children can sort of maybe blame themselves or have that it's it's really important that we sort of can feel comfortable to talk about that and really just consider the impact and I think uh, as as you said Felicity I think people can children can come out with things that totally astound us and, and make us panic I know I've had some moments where I felt really nervous that a child is what I said and don't know what to say back and it's it's going back to that point of saying actually I don't know the answer right now but I'll find out um, and it's really then maybe just talking with parents and things like that about the language they're using with the child as well. So you can link in with that. Um, but as I said, don't be afraid to say, I don't quite know the answer, but, but I'll get back to you. I think I, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I think as teachers and school staff, you will appreciate. Um, my team can stop listening because they've heard it so many times. But um, when my son was four, he went 
to school for his first day. We thought he'd hate it because we just always thought he would. He was that sort of child. You wondered how he was going to get on. He loved it. Absolutely brimming with all of the whole day when he came out of school. And we thought, oh, this is good. Excellent. Went for day two, came out. I'm never going back. I'm never going again. They lied to me. They didn't tell me the truth. They said we were going to the zoo today and they didn't take us. Children are so literal. What had happened on day one was they'd sat on the mat and they'd sung a song, we're all going to the zoo tomorrow. School didn't take him tomorrow and he was really, really cross about that. So the language we use with small children, they take it so literally. If you say somebody has gone to sleep after they've died, they will expect them to wake up. If you say granddad's gone on a long journey and then you're wondering why they won't get on the bus or in a car or on an aeroplane, think back to what you said and how you said it. So open conversations are really key to everything that we do with children in, in bereavement. But the words we use are really, really important. Donna, he won't forgive me for telling you that. He's 21 now. <laughs> he won't forgive me for that one. Um, yeah, just a comment from my, from my own um, sort of experience personally as well is um, I've been a, a nurse and um, well, I'm a nurse and worked in palliative care when my children were quite young. And actually, uh, tea time conversation was often about death and dying. I mean, obviously talking about specific people, but just it was part of my working day. So it was part of tea time conversation. Um, and we were always very honest and open about it. And I think it was easier because obviously it was removed from the children directly. So they could just ask questions and it wasn't hurting. It was fine. But then um, when we did have our own uh, loss in the family, they actually, both children were quite small, it was their grandfather, and, and they were, were, were very sensible about it and talked and said, oh, is that like that time in that case? Um, and, and actually, we were, because it was always something that was open for discussion, they, they were comfortable with it. And then in addition, when my son was in his 20s and in the forces, he was being sent to Afghanistan and actually said mum we need to talk now if I was to die whilst I'm out there and actually you might think gosh that's never a conversation a mother wants to have with their child but you know I knew exactly what he would want how he would want a funeral and you know that is something that is is a gift isn't it but it was only the fact that we could be quite open and quite clear about it um when he actually flew off, then that's when I was, you know, in tears um, and he was fine and he came back and as well. But yes, I think honest and open, very direct language um, is, is definitely key um, to making kind of well-rounded individuals um, as, they, as they grow up. So, so just my experience there. <laughs> no, thank you, Donna, because it does back up. It, it can often be our fear, can't it? It's about what is scary for us. So we might avoid saying certain words or um, actually even, even having a conversation about the subject of death and dying because we're scared of it. Um, that kind of leads me on to uh, Laura's last point was about you. Uh, and uh, although um, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've had lots of really interesting questions, I think a lot of them have been about the children you're working with. So I wanted, to, my question to you is, what impact is this having on you? What impact do you think it might have on you? Um, you've, you've got your own fears, you've got your own losses. Nobody knows what that teacher or that teaching assistant or uh, you know, that, that member of staff has been through necessarily. And some things that children will bring into school or into your child minding business or wherever might press your buttons. Have you, have you had that as an experience? Nobody's speaking to me. I did actually go into a school once to support um, a child whose mother was dying um, and it took me two more visits to actually get past the teaching team it was, it was quite interesting. I was kind of, um, they had so many concerns themselves that they, they were really struggling to support her. 
because of their own experiences. Uh, some members of staff had had losses themselves. Some members of staff didn't know what language to use and what to say. So before I could actually start the work with the child, I needed to work with the, with the, the teaching staff and the school staff to support them to support the child because we can't always be there. You're the ones who are always there. Anything anybody would like to add? Because even if you don't um, uh, answer, what I would like you to do is to go away um, and think about how you're going to support yourself, how your school or your organisation can support you, what networks have you got. We've talked about a first aid kit for children. There's nothing wrong with having an emotional first aid kit for yourself. It's really quite important, actually. There's quite a lot of things coming up on chat. Laura, what were you going to say? Um, I think if, if there's not um, too many more questions, um, if there's anything you want to ask, uh, but not in this forum, because yeah, I understand there's a lot of people here as well, um, my email address is on that last slide. Um, please feel free to email. If there are a few, I might send them some of my colleagues' way as well. So it'll be one of us that replies. Um, but just really, we, we want to thank you for your interest in today as well. Um, it, you're in a very unique situation as schools and, and one of the first people to go back to sort of normality, if you want to call it that. And uh, we hope that we can support you and other bereavement services in the county can support you as much as possible uh, with that. So whether it's um, a question for yourself or a question about a child, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us as well. That's great, thank you. Some of the, the comments that we're having through on chat, I'll just read those out quickly. So um, I don't know who this is from. I don't know it's from iPad. So is that Felicity? I might, yes, yes, she's nodding at me. So my daughter is in the NHS and I've got her last wishes saved on my phone, prompted by the COVID crisis. It, again, it's about having those very brave, very scary conversations, but if you can stop, if something awful were to happen, at least you won't have that regret because you'll know what people want. Um, so that conversation is so important. Um, and then uh, from JMPS, uh, teenagers sometimes say they do not want to talk about the person who died um, as they do not want to upset their parents. I call a parent and explain it's good to all talk openly. It's difficult, isn't it? I had a family many years ago where the, the girl was, uh, she must have been about 15, and they had younger children in the family. It was dad who was poorly. Um, and school knew nothing about dad's illness because she set, kept school completely separate. She had to have that safe place to go where it wasn't discussed. She didn't take it there. So they all act differently. They all behave differently. And we have to, as professionals, we have to flex and bow according to what each individual needs. But you have to know that in the first place, which is why us talking is actually so important. Okay, so if there's no more questions, I don't know whether Donna, whether you want to round it up or whether you want me to. Um, well, I suppose last words for me are just to say that obviously we, we, we can send out the link um, because we have been recording this. Um, so once that's uploaded, um, we can send everyone the link so they can access it um, again to rewatch it. But I know Laura's mentioned sending the slides as well. Um, so you'll, you'll be getting it from all angles. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's the last from me. So I'll let you do the final words, Sarah. Yeah, well, thank you all well, so can, much. Can I just say as well, thank you to everybody who's been leaving nice comments down the side. I've copied and pasted them and sent them yeah. to, to Rebecca and Laura so they can read them properly later. Uh, that's, yeah, thank you. And somebody's just commented, actually, I really miss the students. I can imagine, I mean, it's a grief, isn't it? This blooming COVID business. Everybody is grieving, um, even if you haven't had a death in your family or, or in your friendship group. Children... The professionals we're all grieving because we're all missing each other it is really hard so I suppose my final word is is look after yourselves um, if you're going to do a good job with those children and some of you are I know still working but when you, those of you are going back you're going to be able to do that good job you've got to look after yourself as well so be kind to yourself look after yourselves and keep in touch with us if we can help then let us know 
but thanks to my team again brilliant job guys well done um, and thank you all for coming thank you thank you all thank you